Well, good evening, everyone. All right, let's stand and worship together. We're going to start off by singing an old Charles Wesley hymn, Arise, My Soul, Arise. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears, the bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands, before the throne my surety stands, my name is
evening. It's good to see everybody tonight, and hopefully you had a nice restful afternoon today. How many of you got your nap in? Only about a third of you at the most. I'm surprised on that. So well, hopefully you got some rest and enjoyed your day. Let me just give a couple quick things to uh, make note of. Um, and we have next Sunday, uh, we're going to be welcoming a special guest speaker, uh, Dr. John Lands. He's the executive vice president at Pensacola Christian College. Uh, he is a friend of ours. In fact, he was a man I'd pastored with in West Virginia for several years. He's going to be with us for the day, and so we're looking forward to having him uh, in the morning throughout the day, and so we'll, we'll look forward to that. Also, um, just as a heads up, we have on Wednesday night the se Senior and Retirees Coffee and Donuts and Prayer Time with the Pastors. That's at 8 o'clock. That starts this coming Wednesday, and so we would love to have a good group just come together, be able to pray together, um, talk through ministry together, just enjoy some fellowship, and so... We hope that you'll make plans to be with us. That'll be meeting the fellowship hall and just a, a time there together with the pastors. And um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, there's other notes in the bulletin you can make note of. Uh, there's a couple areas that we could use some volunteers and some help with in the nursery and in the children's ministries. Um, it's been really exciting to see um, throughout this summer and, and going now into the fall time that the children's ministries have been growing. Our nurseries have been growing. Um, our children's ministry has been growing, and um, which we're excited to see God working through that and working in that, but we could also use some more helpers in it. So if you are um, a member and would like to help, we would love to plug you in on that. Um, hopefully at the end of the day, there's still some folks left in here for me to preach to with adults, um, but we're looking forward to the fact that seeing so many young people growing in their knowledge of God and His Word. Uh, we're excited about our WANA program, kicking up tonight as the second, second week of that, and seeing God use that in great ways in the lives of our young people. And um, I don't know how many young people that we have seen come to Christ and get baptized and are growing through that. Um, and every year, uh, the tally is, when we tally up the scriptures that they memorize and work through, it's thousands of scriptures that those Young people are learning and memorizing, and um, although you know, I, I don't know if I don't know if you ever if that was you, like if you grew up going to a like an Awana program or a children's program, and I know they're putting a lot of scriptures in their heart, kind of at a at a pretty quick pace. It's amazing though, and later on in life, when those draw back in, and they're there, and we pull those out at times, and God uses those scriptures to really help encourage us, and. Uh, and so I'm just thankful that they can be a part of that. So if you want to help, you can see myself or come check with the office and we'll get you plugged in to help in that, in that area. Let's go ahead and we'll pray together tonight. And then just as a reminder that we've been taking up our evening and all of our offerings and tithes to the offering boxes. They're at all of the main doors or out in the lobby. And you can drop that in that way. Or we offer it online as well. You can drop that in that way. And so um, Lord will bless you that way. But let's pray together. Father, thank you. For this opportunity to gather together. Lord, as we sang tonight, um, the, the worship that you're worthy of, as the, the morning stars sang together when you spoke everything to, into creation, into existence, and yet we continue as we uh, evaluate and see and, and just are in awe of the beauty around us. We can see that the, they speak of your handiwork. Lord, the, the creation speaks of your, your majesty and power. Lord, your, your detail and your goodness. And so, Father, we just want to praise you tonight. As we start to transition from the summer to the fall season, even more we see that seed time and harvest, as it says in, 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 in the book of uh, in Genesis, uh, Genesis 8, that you would sustain each of those seasons. God, you're a God who created it all. You're a God who sustains it all. And you are keenly aware with each of our lives. And so, Father, we just want to glorify you tonight. I pray that you would just draw us into a deeper, ongoing, trusting, faith-building relationship with you. Father, this has been one of those years in which our faith has been challenged, in which our, our love and grace for one another has been challenged because of the circumstances around us. And, and I pray that you'd continue to do that work in our lives. Help us to stay faithful until you return, until you call us home. God, may we run hard as we looked at this morning in our study in Hebrews. May we run hard after you. And God, I pray that you'd encourage us in that 
and that journey again tonight as we look at your word. God, I pray for our missionaries that are serving all around the world and are spreading the gospel and evangelizing and planting churches and in and, and a variety of different types of ministries. I pray that you would bless them. God, I think of the Collins family as they long to get back to China after Mark has finished up now his, his cancer treatments, but with the borders being closed, they are unable to get back right now. And I pray that you would open the doors so he could be able to get back and continue to work with his churches there. And I just pray that you would um, just direct and guide there. Father, I, I think of Jim and Terry as they've just gotten back. I pray that you would give them uh, now a time to, of rest as they uh, refresh themselves in, in the mission's house and, and be able to report back in. And I pray that be a blessing to them. Um, and Father, I also just want to pray for our, our uh, youth ministries that are happening right now around this facility. Thank you for the Awana program, for the workers that are there to make that happen. And I pray, God, that we would see not only just a lot of kids, but Lord, kids growing in their knowledge of you and their, you know, desire and understanding of who you are. And I pray that there's some that maybe don't know you, that you draw them to salvation. And, um, and God, that they would just grow in your word. Thank you for that time. I pray for the teen ministry. And um, I pray that you would be with Pastor Aaron and the youth workers as they work to encourage our youth and their walk with you. And I pray that you would just continue to bless and grow them there. God, we just thank you again for this opportunity to be together tonight to worship and seek your face. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's continue worshiping together. Let's stand and sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Samuel, Jim and Samuel Volts are going to do special music this evening.
guys. Appreciate that. Is that called Strong Deliver? Is that the name of that song? I Trust in Jesus. I Trust in Jesus. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate that. That was good. All right. Well, we're going to be in Psalm 73 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And I was told something quite interesting this week. Um, for those of you that have kids in Awanas, um, that Awanas actually runs till 7.15, um, so an extra 15 minutes and not 7. And so the Awana directors told me to preach longer. Um, of course, they're not here. They're down there. Um, no, we'll, we'll get you at a normal time and then let you have a little time of fellowship together. But uh, I want to look at a message entitled, Will Your Anchor Hold? On, on January 5th, 1965, Sergeant Charles Robert Jenkins, who was stationed in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, uh, he walked off his, his post. He carefully walked between the landmines and watched his steps and with his rifle in hand and with a white flag on top of it. And he deserted his post and surrendered to the North Koreans because he was afraid of being taken over to Vietnam. And he figured he would be safer in North Korea, um, which to us sounds absolutely insane today. Um, but that's where he went. And so for, for years, um, the United States military had no idea what happened to him. For four decades, they had no idea what had happened to, to Sergeant Jenkins until September 11th, 2004. On that date, Jenkins turned himself over, and, um, and since then he was tried and uh, was convicted. He was demoted from sergeant to private. He was placed in confinement for 30 days and then was given a dishonorable discharge. And... Um, you know, I thought about that, and the truth is, is uh, Christians are often in the heat of the battle, and it, it's always disconcerting to me when we see some who just quit. You know, and they desert their post, or they, they, they go off, and they abandon or leave the faith. And I was reading an article some time ago entitled, Why Do Christians Leave the Faith? Breaking Up with a God Who Failed Them. And here is part of what that article stated. They said, in a study of religious deconversion, we analyzed 50 online testimonies posted by former Christians. And in these testimonies, we found four general explanations for deconversion. The first regarded intellectual or theological concerns, such as the existence of hell uh, or judgment. And so in other words, there was aspects of biblical teaching that they just didn't like. And so they weren't willing to accept that. They weren't accept, willing to accept that there was punishment or hell. And so they, they just left. But the next category is the one that really caught me. And it dealt with those who had a failed relationship with God. Almost half of the group that they analyzed, they had, they had expressed sentiments that in some way God had failed them by his not doing what they thought he should do. In other words, they had in their mind... This is what God should be doing for them and in their lives. And it didn't seem like that that was matching up. In other words, maybe they had been given a prosperity gospel of some sort. That, that if you follow God, it's going to become easy. And these will be the things that you'll have in your life. And it wasn't matching up. And so again, there was this struggle. And, and really, that's the group that kind of fits into Psalm 73 here. Uh, Psalm 73 is... Really, this, this wrestling of faith that takes place in this passage and this battle. And um, thankfully, we see that the author, Asaph, his anchor holds in it. And he tackles the problem not from the ivory tower of, of philosophic ideas, but really from the trenches of painful experience. He's very transparent about his struggle. The struggle of, man, it, what do I do when my theology clashes with my reality? And that's a great question for us to consider tonight. What do I do when my theology clashes with the reality of my life and the things that I see around it? And, um, and so that's what we're going to see tonight. And so in other words, it's the same idea that there was, that what do we do when it doesn't seem like God is doing what we thought he should do? 
when in some way it maybe seems like he failed us. And so what I appreciate about the Psalms is they are extremely and refreshingly honest and transparent. As we read many of them as prayers and as songs that were sung, um, and it's, it's a roller coaster. This one is a roller coaster of honesty and introspection. And Asaph is struggling and is brutal, brutally honest here. And, and I think that teaches us sometimes the, the aspect of prayer. Sometimes I think we maybe incorrectly think, well, I, I, I can't pray what I'm thinking. I can't pray the, the frustrations that I'm feeling. I, I can't say that to God or ask God the questions that I have in my mind. And we, we incorrectly think that because as you read through the Psalms, you find that they were very transparent. They, they wrestle through with their faith. I think of Job, for instance, not in the Psalms, but in the book of Job, after Job had had his, his really everything destroyed and taken from him and and for chapters, he struggles with this and is frustrated and, and in essence is saying, God, I don't, I don't understand why this is happening. Why are you doing this to me? I'm frustrated. This doesn't seem fair. And, and I don't know what the answers are. And what's interesting in the book of Job is God never rebuffs Job for his questions. He, he, he never says it was, it's wrong for you, Job, to be asking these things in prayer. What God does is say, hey, let me show you, Job, who I am. Let me show you why I have the right to do this. But he never rebuffs him for the questions. And so Psalm 73 is really an interesting psalm that is gonna, we're going to find in another one of our but God statements that is going to come a little bit later on. And it's, again, this is, um, Psalm 73 is um, written by Asaph. It's actually starts a different segment in the psalms the psalms are actually broke into five different books and this one starts psalm 73 starts book number three and it carries on for 17 psalms and interestingly asaph is the writer of 12 of them and he also writes psalm 50 and so so who is this guy asaph who's who's this guy and what what is his struggle is he just some kind of, uh, you know, maybe obscure guy in Israel? We find as we read in Second Chronicles, or I'm sorry, First Chronicles 16, is David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. He says, it says in verses 4 and 5, that he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord, to, comm to, excuse me, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. And the first one he lists is Asaph, the chief. The next, next to him was Zechariah, then Jael, then Shemariamoth, Jehael, Metahiath, and Eliah, Beniah, and Obed-Edom. And then Jael with the stringed instruments and harps, but Asaph made music with cymbals. And so what it tells us, this guy is one of the lead musicians in Israel. And he's the cymbal player. Isn't that great? This is a guy, I don't, I don't know if cymbals in those days involved the whole trap set or if it was just his job was but but there was a variety of instrumentation you know i think sometimes we incorrectly think that worship is so limited or should be so limited to certain only instrumentation but yet we see in scripture there was such a variety that god is pleased with here you've got a guy who is the song leader and he's the cymbals player wouldn't that get our attention on sunday mornings Wham! Um, that's who this guy is. So, so this is a godly man, a, a man who loves to worship God and to lead people in worship. He's got a fervency and a passion for God as David appoints him as the, the chief song leader. Now that's Asaph. He writes several songs, but he's struggling here. He's struggling with his with his theology in contrast to the reality of some things he sees around him and so the question is is again will your anchor hold when it's tested in the storms of life and so what this psalm is going to do it's going to start on a peak in verse one as he's going to make a statement we're going to see here that the lord is good he's going to make this peak statement and then all of a sudden he's tipping down on the roller coaster and he starts heading downhill real fast 
with his struggles and the things that he has seen around him. It's going to then start to bottom out in verse 17 and then work its way as he starts to turn the corner and he starts climbing back out and starting to come to a different perspective as he wrestles through this psalm. And then we're going to see him come to really a great confession with our but God statement tonight. As we'll see it there, actually we'll start in verse 26, where it says, My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. If all we read was verse 1 and then just read here, really verse 26 or 28, we'd say, man, this is, Asaph is doing great. In the middle, there's a whole lot of thought process going on. A whole lot of faith struggle going on. And I find that refreshingly encouraging. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we find ourselves in a similar place as Asaph. Where that faith struggle is going on. And we're saying, man, I want to follow God. I do love God. I know He's good. But my intellectual ascent is being challenged. And I'm working that through. And so let's walk that through tonight. Let's see His journey. And to see how He handled it. So we understand what to do in our theology is challenged by the reality we see around us. So let's pray together and then we'll look in. Father, thank you for this opportunity again to dive into your word. God, I am so thankful that your word is just so real and and raw and transparent. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us by that. Lord, I pray that we would really be open and honest with you in a real and living relationship with you. And that as we see Asaph's journey here in this psalm that was a song recorded for the Israelites to sing for generations and generations to come or that this reality of this faith struggle is 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 certainly real for all of us at times and and Lord I pray you help us to find encouragement and strength from the discoveries that Asaph found as he journeyed in this struggle of faith thank you for our time together tonight in your name we pray amen Well, it's really just, it breaks into two segments I want to kind of see tonight. And the first is the grievous conflict of perspective. And so here we're we're going to really look and just follow the text of what Asaph is going to say. He's going to not ignore reality, really deal with it head on. And we're going to find that it's really a matter of perspective because he, he starts to see certain things and it makes other things fuzzy. Have you ever, have you ever had your eyes tested? gone to an eye doctor and they have one of those occluder um, machines Um, I've only ever done it once Uh, I had my eyes tested and and I thought I had pretty good eyesight and I said doc I can you know I can read the clock and things there and he said well just keep watching the clock I said okay and he starts flipping the different things you know the different lenses in front and all of a sudden he put one in and I was like whoa what is that he said well I just fixed your vision and and all of a sudden, everything became clear. But he put the wrong one in it, everything became fuzzy. And really what happens here is many times, it's a matter of what are we, what are we working our worldview through? What are we seeing our worldview? What are we seeing God through and, and challenging that? And so he starts with a great place here. He's going to start in verse 1 with a casting of the anchor of faith. Because he says there, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Man, that's a strong, great statement. God is good, and he's good to those who are pure in heart. And this is the truth. We can anchor down to this. He casts his anchor in the truth that God is good. He had learned that the truth about God. And he was a faithful and avid worshiper of God. So this wasn't just mere words. It was something he had sang, and he had worshiped God throughout his life. But for a time he was experiencing and witnessing, didn't add to his theology. We're going to see that later on in verses, really, verses 2 through 15. And, um, but so there's this, again, this struggle going on. But he casts his anchor down to this reality of truth. But what's our, what is our anchor? Where do we start with? 
What do we anchor down into? And I, I think Hebrews gives us a great text on this in Hebrews 6, verses 19 to 20, in that Jesus Christ, uh, regarding Jesus Christ, that God is good and He has granted us salvation through Christ. It says, This hope we have about Jesus Christ being offered to us for salvation, we have this as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. So, so as a Christian, if we know Jesus Christ, we've cast our anchor into the fact that God is good, and He's so good that He's given us Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, and through that, we have access within the veil in the very presence of God, that our salvation is secured by Jesus Christ. And so as a believer, we cast our, our anchor of faith in Jesus Christ. And, and so we, we start there. And, and I think that's helpful for us as we think about when we are wrestling and we're working this through is scriptures come to our mind. And scriptures encourage us of truth, of who is our God. And we take things transparently to him. Recently I was praying through some things and was kind of wrestling through some things. And it was amazing as God would bring different scriptures to bear into my mind. And, and one of them was even this morning's text in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And, and then verse 3, for consider him. And, and just thinking about Jesus, and I think as we, we have this ascent, um, and, and, and we, we know these things to be true. And that's important. So, so for instance, we right now are with our youth, we are putting biblical truths into their hearts and their minds and their conscience and and you've done the same you've taken biblical truths you've put them in your hearts we've got this anchor of truths but it has to become more than just a a mind matter or a a head matter it must become a heart matter of faith the goodness of god that is proclaimed throughout scripture must become more than simply head knowledge it must be a matter of faith that leads to faithfulness. Mere intellectualism isn't enough. And so a, a theology and a faith that is never challenged and tested is very weak and is untrustworthy. And so what God is going to do in our lives to make that faith have, ha have substance to it is he puts us in different challenges. He allows the reality of things around us to challenge that. And so Asaph here says, this is what I know. I know God is good to Israel, to such are, are pure in heart. This is where I start from, and I believe this. But now we're going to see it become tested. And so the question really starts from, though, first, is your anchor cast deep in the heart of faith and love of who God is? Do you believe in that? But then it moves from there, and we're going to see this, then the contrast of perception as he starts to say, well, wait a minute, this is, what I, this is what I know, and I've been taught, and I sing, and I lead worship with, but here's what I see, and, and, and things around me, and I, I'm, I'm struggling, and, and so in verses, 10 through, or verses 2 through 14, these next verses, Asaph is remarkably transparent honest about how he's perceiving God the wicked notice let's read it he says in verse 2 but as for me my feet had almost stumbled my steps had nearly slipped so he's saying man I'm in shaky ground because this is what I know but I'm struggling for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked for there's no pains or pangs in their death but their strength is firm they are not in trouble as other men they are not plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge of the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease, and they increase in riches. And notice verse 13 and 14. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my heart in innocence, for all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. 
And he says, man, this has been just this journey, this struggle. Is why does it seem like the wicked prosper? Why does it seem like the more that I try to purify myself and be right with God, that they get ahead and I don't? How come is it seems that it's, it's harder for those who are the children of God? Doesn't it seem like it should be opposite of that? Doesn't it seem like for, for those of us who, 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 who pursue God and, 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 and trust in Him that we would get the breaks? I mean, isn't He the one who's in control? He's sovereign and, 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 and He's a providential God. Like, why does this work out? That's what, that's what Asaph's saying. This doesn't seem to click. How come we're having this? Very transparent. He says, I almost slipped. My feet almost slipped. My, my anchor almost gave way when I perceived what others were going through. And so he's in trouble as he looks around and he's reconciling his faith with what he sees. This God-inspired worship leader is ready to walk away. He's on the edge of throwing the towel in, but he's, he, he doesn't keep the cause of his troubles a secret. Notice again in verse 3. And he says there, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He uses some key words here. He speaks of those that he's observing, and he speaks of them as the boastful um, and, or the arrogant there, and also of the wicked. I was envious of the boastful, and this, this word there refers to, to people who who make themselves known. They're arrogant about it. Uh, there's, there's those who just, they just pride around or parade around and everything is great in their lives. They, they're the ones that you see on Facebook that they never have a bad day. How come they never post that they've had problems? And he says, I see this stuff and I wonder, why is it that they're the boastful ones? The arrogant, and he says, and he also refers to, then he says, and, and when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, and, you know, it's interesting here as I was reading on this, and I've always considered the wicked that he's referring to as the wicked pagan Gentiles, those who weren't followers of God. But then as I read on this, some thoughts came to me, or some, some readings that I came across got me thinking, and I think this reasonably could be Israelites. Israelites who either don't have time for God or are hypocrites. That, that they're just kind of on the fringes. They were what we, would, what we would call that they are, you know, Israelites or followers of God in name only. They didn't truly care about God. They truly didn't, you know, try to sanctify themselves and pursue God. They were in name only. They, they would do some things here and there. But, and and I, I think that for a couple of reasons. It, one, that there is nowhere in this psalm the wicked are called by any name which could distinguish them as Gentiles. There's nothing that says these are definitely non-Jews. Second of all, verse 1 seems to focus on God's relationship to Israel rather than on mankind in general. In other words, like this seems like he's looking, observing Israelites. And then the theology reflected in verse 11 is one that a pagan in origin would have never have said speaking of a singular God as it says how does God know and is there knowledge in the most high a, a pagan Gentile in those days would have been polytheistic many gods and yet their statement here is how does God know I can kind of do my thing and and so they've almost this is almost like those who were Israelites who just kind of said I don't really have time for God I'm going to be a Jew but I'm going to do my own thing and God says, wait a minute, Asaph's saying, wait a minute, I have tried to, to, to purify myself. I have cleansed my heart in vain, and, and these are the ones who are the hypocrites. They're the ones I'm seeing that they, everything is going great in their lives, and it doesn't jive. And so he says he's envious of them. And then notice he also says he was hung up by their prosperity. And I think that word is a misleading translation in our English, because the Hebrew word is the word shalom, from which we have our word peace. Peace would actually be a better translation there. He says, uh, when I see their, the peace of the wicked. In other words, it seems like everything goes great in their lives. They don't have the struggles that I've got going on. 
the financial struggles or the, the struggles with people around me, it seems like everything is always great. And so he says, I, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. There's this battle, and, and we see that all the way through as he talks through the different challenges. And, and, and so there's this aspect of, you know, he's saying, I, I, I kind of want that good life. I, I kind of want this to, I kind of want what they got. You know, one of the dangers, I think, of social media is it can draw discontentment very quickly. We read about everybody else's stuff going on, and we're like, man, everything looks always great. Like, their, their kids are always dressed perfectly and smile so nicely, and my kids were happy if they got out the door with shoes on, and, and, and we're lucky if we wiped off their face before they came to church, and how, how come it's always so much easier for them, and, and, and we can start to become discontented here, and I think that's where Asaph is struggling with here, a little bit of a discontentment in his faith journey with God. Does, does some of that stuff entice you? Do, do we sometimes long for the easy life? I think that, that we do sometimes. It's an interesting thing. I was um, uh, reading just about some Greek mythology. Some, one time there's an a ancient Greek mythology regarding a, a Greek god named Tantalus. Um, he was King of Lydia and son of Zeus. And he was a, a favorite uh, mortal of the gods until one day he deceived this is again, this is obviously all mythology, but he dis- tried to deceive them. And so the gods contem- condemned him to hang in a tree down in Tartarus, the lowest region of the underworld. And under the tree was a pool of water, but when Tantalus would stoop down to try to get a drink of the water, it would dry up. And then hanging over his head in this tree was all this lush fruit, but every time he would reach up for the, 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 the fruit, the, the, the wind would blow the branches away. And so he became a, a symbol of frustration. Today his name is remembered in the word tantalize, uh, from which we get that idea of, boy, this is so tantalizing. I so much want this. And Asaph's kind of there. He's saying, man, I, I'd really like to have all of that stuff. I'd, I'd like to have the easy stuff. I'd like to have the, the financial just ease. I'd, I'd like to have, you know, those material things that others might have. And so Asaph is struggling, traveling downhill fast because he's kind of missed the forest for the trees. It's a matter of perspective. And, and, and you notice what he starts focusing on then. As he starts to analyze, he starts to, to focus on that, that they don't have any pains as they die. It's easy life and, and they're prosperous and, and fat. In other words, they're the, that they've, they've got all this abundance and they're just, everything is going great. They seem like they're prosperous and increase in riches. And, and so there's where he's at. He's very transparent in this grievous conflict of perspective. But now let's flip the side and let's continue on and see the glorious conquest of presence. And... We're going to kind of see this break out into some different elements that caused him to kind of hold back and to to turn the corner and hold the line, so to speak. The first is a caution of the faithful. He, He says it there in verses 15 and 16. He says, if I had said, I will speak thus. In other words, if I were to proclaim all this struggle and and walk away and say, that's it. I'm throwing the towel. I'm going after all of this. Behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. And when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. It's an interesting statement because he says there, there's some cautions here that cause me to say, whoa, I just can't, I can't just turn and run. And one of them he says here is there's this aspect of that I'm drawing strength from the faithful men of the past. I've been, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. He says, I, I don't want to be untrue to the testimonies of faith, of the heroes of the faith. And, and that's where we've looked at on, on Sunday mornings, that there is that, there, there's that great cloud of witnesses who state that, yes, it's going to be difficult at times. They wandered around in sheepskin and goatskins, and they didn't have all those things, and yet they pressed on by faith. And, 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 and Asaph is saying, Yes, and I remember that, and I see how difficult it was for people like Enoch and Noah and Abel and all those others of the faith, and it, 
encouraged me to say, wait a minute, am I going to quit when it's a little bit difficult for me? And so it says it holds me in here. By the way, it's good for us to have other believers around us that can be help anchor us in. There are times when we're going to need to lean on some other people's faith at times. There are times when it's been helpful for me in my journey of life to be reminded, you know, man, I can see the faith of my dad and my mom. I can see the faith of, of, of other faithful people and friends and people in ministry around me. And, and that helps hold me in to say, wait a minute, am I going to state that everything they hold is untrue? And, and there are times when, when one member stumbles, the others are there to help pick up. The Bible refers to. And so we need that. And Asaph says, that is helping me here. Um, and he's drawing near to the giants of the faith around him. And that helps hold him up. Do you know, that you, ever, you ever been to out west and been to Yosemite and seen the giant sequoia trees? Uh, we got a chance to go out on our honeymoon to out there. And massive trees. I mean, some of them are so big that you could drive cars through them and things. And they're towering giants, but, they're, but their roots actually are actually quite shallow. And they've always tried to analyze what makes these things not tip over. And it's what they've done is their roots intertangle with all the other trees around them. And so they, they actually lean on each other. It helps balance them together. And in essence, there's a reality of the church in which we, we weave together and we say, hey, I'm going to help hold you up and you can help hold me up. And when I'm having a rough day, I can call on you and, and, and I'm blowing around. You can say, hey, hey, here's okay. Let's go back to scripture. Let's pray together. And there's this aspect of, you know, my roots are, are help. We help each other there. And the second thing that I think is another aspect that drives into here is the aspect of he's being cautious to not hinder the faith of those that may be around him that are weaker in the faith. So he's going to guard his tongue. He says, I... And I think that's maybe another way you can look at this, that I don't want to be untrue to the generation of your children. I don't want to lead them wrong. I'm, I'm trying to, to, to wrestle through this. I don't want to just come out and, and unwisely just blurt out all this to everyone. One of the things that's been really frustrating to me in this last year or two is to have had some prominent um, authors and um, song leaders who are Christian authors and song leaders who've posted out why they are abandoning the faith and they've just put out this long tirade of things and and i'm thinking well that was a great way to lead people and and asaph has some discretion to say you know what i want to be cautious with my struggles i'm just going to blurt this out to everybody and so you think well pastor it sounds like you're having contradictory statements that we we lean on each other but yet we don't share this no i think we need to be having some that we lean on but we don't get up in front of you know a grand audience and say i'm leaving i'm this is all i'm struggling this is leaving uh, you know this doesn't make sense for me and that's very unwise and and so asaph says i'm wrestling with this and i'm going to hold in here yet and so there is this caution of the faithful Secondly, I see a clarity of the flesh. And here's really the, the tide shifts for him. Verse 17. He said, all this, earlier I'll start in verse 16 to kind of build to it. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went to the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Who's there? It's the people of verse 3. The boastful, the wicked. He says, when I drew near to God, all of a sudden it started to come into clear focus. And, it's, and so Asaph here begins to take a step back and gaze on the forest rather than simply on a few trees. And what he does is draw near to God in his sanctuary in a presence and look through the spectacles of what God is doing and who he is. And it begins to change his perspective. He understood the light bulb came on. And notice what he saw. He starts to realize that there is a longer perspective out there. In verses 18 to 20, it says, here's what I understood. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. 
They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. In other words, he says, this looks all like it's, it, it's wonderful on the outside. But on, on the inside, that fruit is rotten. And man, it, it is going to come down on them. This propped up deck of cards is going to come crashing down at some point. In 1719, Isaac Watts published a metrical version of Psalm 73. And when he came to this part of the psalm, he, he wrote these lyrics. He says, There as in some prophetic glass, I saw the sinner's feet high mounted on a slippery place beside a fiery pit. I heard the wretch profanely boast till at thy Till, till at thy frown he fell, his honors in a dream were lost, and he awakes in hell. In other words, all of a sudden we see the end of the story. That, that there's a more than beyond. There's more beyond than just this temporal little thing here. And so, the question is, how do we enter in the sanctuary to change our perception? How how do we put the spectacles on and be able to say, okay, let me see this through clearer. I think one is transparency of prayer, as we see Asaph doing. He says, I drew near to God, and I came and prayed, and I think there's this aspect of just digging into His Word and allowing God's Word to speak truth back into our hearts and minds. And all of a sudden, it becomes clear. I think there's also the aspect of, again, the local church, of having brothers and sisters in Christ who, who, who we, we draw on that encouragement and strength from one another. And so all of a sudden, it, it brings clarity to his situation that wasn't there before. The third thing that we see here as we're going to move quickly is the conviction of his heart. As he understood and saw it through the lens of God and his word, he became convicted for his lack of faith. He actually says in verse 21, I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. But I love this in verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. He says, man, I wrote about how I struggled and how my feet almost slipped. And I was wrestling through this and I was questioning you, God. I was at the point of saying, God, you're not being fair. It's not right. I was so foolish. And yet, nevertheless, you are continually with me. God didn't abandon him because he asked the question. God was there to say, hey, let me pick you right back up. Don't you love that in, in the passage where, where uh, Peter's walking the water by faith to Christ, and even though he gets afraid of the circumstances and the, and the, and the storm, it's all around him, and he's walking on water, and he gets his eyes off Christ, and he begins to sink. The moment he cries out, Lord, save me, Jesus reaches down and picks him right back up. And they walk back together on the water back to the boat. That's, that's what God does. He, he never lets go of our hand. A couple weeks ago on Labor Day, I mentioned we were at Gettysburg. And uh, Kingston, our little guy who turns two this week, he wanted, you know, you go to different places there. And there's rocks you can climb on at Devil's Den or a little round top. And, and, and he wanted to climb on some of these rocks. And, you know, at that age, that toddler age, they, they think they're more capable and steady than they are. And so I would climb up with him and I would hold his hand. And we would go across the rocks and, and all of a sudden he would tip. And, and, but I would have him and I would just pick him back up and keep him there on, and steady him and keep him there safe. Um, and then he would, I would get down and he would jump off. He'd be up about seven, eight foot and without any reservation, just run off whoo, out there and just knew I'd catch him. And, um, but that's the idea that Asaph gets to. God, I remind, I'm reminded again, you, you never let me go. You, you didn't abandon me through all of this. I'm safe in your hands. You held me by your hand. And God, you picked me right back up. You put me back on the solid ground of truth. And he says, man, how foolish was I to start to pursue off a different journey. But it's so, rea it's so real. Uh, even in, even in uh, Bunyan's book pilgrim's progress and he reveals that times when 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 christian would get off get pursuing after other things and then he'd get brought back on the path and god's still faithful he's still good and that's what we see here and so we see the the conviction of his heart and there's the encouragement there 
as he pours out his heart with repentance and gets back on the pathway again. And then we come to our final point here that really is our but God statement here, the com- comprehension of his presence. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It, it has the, the ring of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I, I don't need anything else. Whom, and I, whom have I in heaven but you? What else would I possibly need when I have you? It's all of a sudden he comes back in and saying, man, I was so getting my eyes off on these other temporal things and these other worldly things, and then I realized none of that matters if I've got Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Asaph says, man, I've come back around. You see how he's, he's taken the roller coaster. He started up here, and he, he dived down in with his struggle of faith. He turns up the corner, and he comes back in and says, man, my feet had almost, uh, my, my, my flesh and my heart failed, but God is the strength of my heart. He carries me through this. He strengthens me in those times, and he gives me strength. And so there's a great truth in this, that when I am failing thinking this isn't going to work that God is my strength and encouragement he's our rock so there's a there's a boxing term that is used when one is ready to acknowledge defeat and the boxer's trainer wants to call the fight he'll throw in the towel we know that term throw in the towel it means I'm done and unfortunately we see sometimes Christians that are saying man I'm ready to throw in the towel and Asaph was there my feet almost slipped and I, and I pray that as we get to those times sometimes, that we would read texts like this and say, yeah, but God, but God is faithful. He is my strength and my portion. Whom have I in heaven but you? I don't need anything else but you. So let me just draw out a couple quick principles in, in closing here just to think through this. First is that the ultimate good in life is not prosperity, nor the absence of pain, nor the, but the nearness of God. And many times I fear that when we pray, we pray for the wrong thing because we are so nearsighted. We pray for the healing. We pray for this situation to be resolved. But the ultimate good and peace is Him. And that's important for us. Secondly, pain serves a good purpose of putting life and death, pain and prosperity into perspective. It, it puts muscle on our faith is it takes our head knowledge of what we theologically assent to, and God says, let me test if you actually believe it. Let me help you put faith on that, so you don't just say God is good, you actually lean into it. You actually draw close to me. And so, it pain serves that good purpose. Thirdly, we can see from Asaph's experience that dealing with the problem of pain is a process there, there is that natural struggle and that's okay it's okay to to wrestle through that in those times go back and search the lord and pray and be transparent with him in those times don't put away the book get out the book and study it and read what god's saying to you in those times don't cast away from you other believers but rather draw on their strength but that struggle is a process And then fourthly, the ultimate solution for peace and fulfillment is not a thing or a creed, but it's God himself. That's the ultimate solution. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for just the reminder of your faithfulness and your goodness that you are good. And God, there are times when I feel you you allow the testing of that in our lives so that we could have actually the greater good. Many times we get allured and, and we're, we're, we're tantalized by some temporal things of, of maybe ease of life or financial security or whatever it might be when ultimately the greatest good is you. But God, you are the strength and portion of our life. 
thank you for that reminder this morning or this evening. I just thank you for who you are and thank you for allowing us to be able to draw out those things before you, to be to be transparent, honest in our struggles. And God, help us to be anchored deeply in our faith. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much, and I hope that is an encouragement to you. Um, we're going to jump into some more but God statements in the future here that are going to be more um, in the New Testament um, and digging in there. But next week we'll have Dr. John Land sharing with us. You've got a few minutes if you've got kids in Awana, so just hang out and enjoy some fellowship together, get a chance to talk together, and uh, that'll be ending in about 10 minutes. But otherwise, have a great rest of the week.